it's Tony Robbins. Welcome to the podcast today. Listen, I'm very excited today because today you're going to meet a dear friend of mine, Tom Bilyeu of Quest. Quest Nutrition is the superstar in the industry. They literally came out of nowhere and he's grown his brand 57,000% in three years. He literally has built a billion dollar brand from nothing. And it isn't obviously just Tom by himself. He's got a group of partners. And what he's going to share in this interview with our hostess, Ann York, is really how they built the company, what they did to take a crowded field, imagine the nutrition field, how crowded it is, and really quickly stand out, how they use social media, how they fell in love with their customers, their clients, instead of falling in love with their protein bars or their products, as great as they are, as much research as they have, what I really love is he really practices the seven forces of business mastery. And Tom has been a follower of my work literally since the very beginning, and he's applied everything to build this billion dollar brand. And it's a brand that, like, it's fun to interact with them. They've done such an amazing job job of building an identity really from such a small place with very little capital in the very beginning, but they did it with passion. They did it by finding how to recruit the right people who share their vision and passion. And they've applied all the seven forces that make any company grow geometrically that I teach. So I think you're going to really love this process. Get ready to take some notes and get ready to take on the passion, the energy of Tom Bilyeu of Quest Nutrition. Tony has seven forces of business mastery, creating an effective business map, constant and strategic innovation, world-class marketing, sales mastery systems, financial and legal analysis, maximization and optimization, and creating a raving fan culture. These are the seven key parts of any business that must be consistently managed to consistently grow and succeed. Did you know that 50% of all startups are gone within just the first year? and 96% of all businesses fail after 10 years. You must understand that even a small business requires consistent improvement in many areas simultaneously if you want to compete and win. What happens a lot of the time is that entrepreneurs will have some core skill sets like writing code or creating amazing products, but then their marketing skills are subpar, or their marketing skills are incredible, but their inability to make effective financial analysis ruins their chances to succeed. Poor decisions are made, and those decisions are what shape our business destiny. To talk about this, how the seven forces of business mastery helped him turn an idea into a billion-dollar company, we have Tom Bilyeu, CEO of Quest Nutrition. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be here. I'm, I am a huge believer in Tony Robbins' system, and, and having had the chance to meet him, uh, he is even more amazing in a one-on-one -on -one than he is at, at his seminars, and he's mind-blowing at his seminars. So uh, it is truly an honor. Right. Which, which events have you attended, just out of curiosity? Um, I did an Unleashing the Power Within here in Los Angeles, and then I actually do um, – it's not – actually a podcast so we also release it as a podcast and he was a guest on that show so I had a chance to ask him questions one-on-one -on -one, which is really special right. so I'd love to start by hearing a little bit about your own business history so what was your original idea and some of your first steps to turning that into a reality well, when I began, I, my training is actually as a filmmaker and was headed down the path of making movies and had a script uh, that I wrote turned into a feature film and I was deeply dissatisfied with the outcome and realized that I was coming to the industry with my hand out asking for money and that of course left other people in control. And when it comes to artistic expression and you know having uh, the ability to control the final outcome is really critical to making it a satisfying emotional experience. So I uh, met some guys who said, hey, the problem is that you, know, you don't understand the fundamental principles of business. If you come with us, we can teach you business and you can get rich and you know, you'll go back to the industry in control because you'll have the money. And of course, things that sound too good to be true usually are. Uh, and that ended up being me um, getting – I got hired as a copywriter in that. Uh, and their promise to me actually, while not sort of what I had in my, my fantasy when we began, ended up becoming way more powerful and, and changed the entire course of my life and went something like this. They brought me on as a copywriter and they said, but this is a startup, so don't think of yourself as a copywriter. Look at the problems that we face as a company, help us solve those companies, and you can have any role in the company that you want as long as you become the right person for that role. And hiding in there really was a growth mindset, which I hadn't really encountered before. And, and I realized that I could grow and learn and get better and, and develop. And so I took them very seriously. 
and these are the guys who are now still my business partners um, 13 years later. Uh, we've done mo multiple companies together, but it started as a technology company, and we built that from nothing to the 42nd fastest growing company um, in technology in North America. Um, that was in 2010, but uh, came up sort of very unfulfilled, you know, to use Tony's language, you, you strive so hard for success as you have in your mind, it's all money focused, you get the money and then you realize, wow, I don't, um, I don't feel that sense of well-being or fulfillment that I expected to feel and that was a, a really crushing moment for me and um, I hit what I call emotional rock bottom and just realized I wasn't prepared to do that anymore. Um, so here we were standing in this beautiful conference room overlooking the Pacific Ocean um, and I turn to my business partners and, and say, I quit. You know, I can't do this anymore. I'm not fulfilled. This hasn't turned out the way that I thought it would. I'm, I, while I'm financially doing well, I'm emotionally bankrupt. Um, so yeah, and I left and, and that was it. And I slid my, you know, metaphorically, but I slid my shares back across the table and I said, if I don't cross the finish line, I don't think I should get anything for that. Um, best of luck to you guys. And then as I'm pulling into my driveway that night, they called me up on the phone and they said, come out to dinner with us. So went out to dinner with them because I you know, had so much love for them uh, that a simple request like that, no problem. Go out to dinner and they say, look, we could do this without you, but we don't want to. So come back and we've been feeling the same way that you've been feeling. Let's sell this company and let's do something completely different. And that's led us into the the era of fulfillment in our lives where we decided we were going to prioritize that above all else we were going to love what we were doing even if we were failing we were going to believe in what we were doing we were going to deliver value as priority number one we were going to stop worrying about money and entirely focus on delivering value to the customer and that that shift changed everything and um, the company that we're doing now quest nutrition um, is the second fastest growing company in North America and we make more in a day than that company made annually. So it's, it's utterly astonishing to see how once you put your customer first and really think about I want to do something amazing for them at every touch point, not just the product, but I want the customer service to be amazing. I want their shopping experience to be amazing. Uh, if they meet our street team on the streets, I want their day to have been better for that interaction. Once you do that, once you really put value at the center of everything you do, then the money comes. And it's, it's just been an amazing change to see. Wow. So in the early days of the business, how did you work to define who you were and who you wanted your customers to be and what business you needed to be in in the long term? We joke that Quest was a company born out of misery. So we really more, even more than we knew who we wanted to be, we knew who we didn't want to be. And we didn't want to be doing things we didn't love. We didn't want to be doing things we weren't passionate about. So, you know, we got together, there's three of us that founded the company and we said, okay, what, what do we each love enough that we're going to have the energy, the enthusiasm and the passion to keep fighting when things get really hard? And for three very different reasons, the answer was health and fitness. So... One of my partners who's in charge of product R&D, uh, he is absolutely obsessed with mystery, with solving grand challenges, so things that other people just believe are unsolvable, that are total riddles. Uh, he wanted to get in and solve those. And nutrition, there's no bigger riddle or mystery that we're dealing with at a grand scale than that. Um, you know, there's so many factors that go into nutrition and human metabolism, quite frankly, uh, that it's, it's a really um, – conflicted and confusing arena that we're trying to go in and simplify and give people some control um, over the things that they're eating. So that's what attracted him. My other partner is an Iowa farm boy, literally wanted to get his hands dirty again. We've been dealing in technology for so long. It's so ephemeral. Uh, he wanted to get his hands back on some equipment and, and is really, in, in many ways, the unsung hero of this company because it's some of the accomplishments that we've made in manufacturing, literally engineering our own equipment. Uh, when people told us that the bar we wanted to make couldn't be made um, that have, have set us up for the kind of success that we've had. And then for me, it was deeply personal. And I grew up in a morbidly obese family, watched people that I loved very, very much struggle profoundly with their weight and their overall relationship to food. And I just really wanted to save my mom and my sister. And that was my driving force. And look, we're not uh, blind. We knew that there's 
you know, hundreds of millions, if not billion or more people that struggle with food in the same way that they do. So it really is globally a grand challenge. And metabolic disease, which is ultimately our stated mission is to end metabolic disease, is, is very massive. But, um, and, and obviously to end that, we would necessarily create a large business. But for me, the touch point was those people that I knew, that I loved, that I saw all the time and, and didn't want to see them struggle, but wanted to give them a beautiful thing that they could eat, that they could love as much as they love you know, a bowl of ice cream, which is, you know, other than nutritionally, a bowl of ice cream is pretty amazing. Um, so wanted to give them something that they could really enjoy. And so that became the genesis. It was both from our side, the thing that we wanted to do that we would love, even if we were failing. And then from the customer side and an area that we really felt we could deliver if we worked hard enough at it, deliver profound value. So starting a company with two people that, um, I imagine you're friends with and you'd worked with before in the past that for a lot of people is a dream right? To be able to, to create something with uh, others that you, you truly trust. Um, what I wanted to ask is how did you decide who would play what role? Because Tony has this idea of there are three archetypes, the artist, the manager, and the entrepreneur. And you know, the artist loves to produce and they want to create something and put it out in the world. The manager is very focused on processes and people. And then the entrepreneur just loves risk. Right, so Steve Wynn, Steve Wynn is the ultimate entrepreneur. I mean, there's lots of people who call themselves entrepreneurial, but they're not true entrepreneurs. So it sounds like you started off as an artist, and then you maybe adapted into more of a manager entrepreneur, not entrepreneur role. What about your your co-founders? Uh, how did you, especially when you're first starting out, how did you figure out how to play to your core strengths as individuals? What's interesting is I think there's all three of those characteristics in most people, and it's a question of to what degree do they favor one over the other. So exactly. my business partner, Mike, who's the Iowa farm boy, you know, for him, process is um, just absolutely critical. He likes the concreteness. He likes being able to remove himself from the world of dreaming and vision and really make it tangible and actionable. That He thoroughly, thoroughly enjoys that. Um, and then my partner, Ron, and I, who are probably a little more similar to each other than either of us are to Mike, are both sort of a balance of the artist and the entrepreneur, but with great, great respect for the need for process. Um, so we actually broke the company up differently based on interest and skill set. Uh, but we, you know, having worked together for so long, you know, we were together almost a decade before we launched Quest you really begin to understand the, the dynamic of the other person, of what they enjoy, what they're good at. Um, and so we break it up this way. We look at it as people, process, and product. So um, I handle people, so I do sales and marketing um, and uh, customer support and things like that, all the things that really are high touch from a people perspective, HR. Um, and then my business partner, Ron, handles the product and he is just the consummate product guy in the nutrition space. He loves it so much and is so utterly fascinated by these nutritional challenges that um, you know his his whole life, even before we started this company, really was dedicated to figuring some of this stuff out. And then Mike, very much so, is happiest in the process, um, but has a, a tremendous respect for the need for the entrepreneurial risk taking and the need for um, you know creations. So it's, it's really a, a good mix where, where we sort of know when to lean more heavily on one of those uh, traits than the other. So if process is what is really called for, even though Ron and I don't sort of gravitate towards that naturally, like we understand, okay, we're going to have to put all our weight behind what Mike is trying to pull off here. Um, and then, you know, if we have to dream big or something and take a big risk, Mike will come along and, and really understand the need for that. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a beautiful dynamic, if I'm honest. And, and you're right, for us, it is a dream to work together. So it sounds like you've been focused uh, pretty primarily on the two forces of uh, world-class strategic marketing and then innovation, which Tony always says, marketing and innovation, those are the two most important things. What, uh, what challenges did you face? I mean, th the space that you were moving into was fairly saturated even at the time that you started. So what was your general approach to be able to, to 
meet the customer's needs in a way that nobody else could and to, to speak to them in a way that nobody else could. We really look at our product as a zero to one event. And if you've read Peter Thiel's book uh, about creating something where there is currently nothing and that being the biggest opportunities in any business rather than incremental improvement, it's really the introduction of something new. So when we were looking at the protein bar market, when we first started looking at it back in 2009, there were between flavors and companies something like 1,600 new protein bar flavors and or companies that were launched that year and it, they were being launched into a declining category. But the thing nobody had done was remove the sugar and keep it tasting good. So you had people that were pulling the sugar out but their bars tasted like cardboard and you had people whose bars tasted really good but they had literally north of 20 grams of sugar. So there was nothing absolutely nothing in that ultra low, no added sugar. And, and I say both of those on purpose because not, I think some people have a misconception of that, you know, fruit juice, but it's not added sugar. So we weren't playing that game. It was truly the only sugar in our product was coming from the nuts that we were using in the nut butter or in our bars where we have a tiny amount of real dried fruit. You'd get a little bit from that. So, but it put our sugar grams at like one or two. Um, and then sugar wasn't an ingredient in our facility anywhere. Like you couldn't even accidentally put sugar in. So, and then they still tasted like they had sugar. So it was a really big uh, breakthrough in the industry. It's why we were able to grow as quickly um, as we did. Well, what's great about that is that the timing was perfect because I don't know what they called it, it's a sugar phobia, but you know, all these studies came out and there was a general shift, I think, in the nutrition space to start to understand what sugar has been doing to our bodies for decades. So the it was it was well timed. Yeah, and you know, I'd love to say, yeah, hey, we did that on purpose. Uh in any in any big success, I think there's always an element of luck and we're not bashful about that. It really was just really, really wonderful timing. There was a shift happening in people's perception of what they should be eating. And then on top of that, another shift was happening and that was in social media. So in our last business, we didn't use social media at all. In fact, people at that time were saying that Facebook was just a distraction at work. How are companies ever going to use it to their advantage? And you know, as we started really looking at it, it was like, wait a second, it doesn't doesn't have to be looked at from that perspective. You can look at it as what it really is, which is a megaphone and a way to connect. And if we can leverage those two properties, we could do something really, really powerful. Because if you give people something positive to say within minutes of an interaction with your company, they can speak to a global audience. I mean, people would have killed for that, you know, 50 years ago. And also you get real time feedback from your customers. So they'll tell you directly if they have a problem, if there's something wrong or something they like. And that, you know, instant feedback where you can develop a real connection is, is incredibly powerful. And when we started, we said, look, let's build this company authentically. I don't ever want to have to worry that somebody's going to use something against me, um, that, you know, I, I slip up and I say in an interview or whatever. So let's just actually be who we are with all of our weirdnesses and our bizarre quirks and let's be us. Um, and so that, that was a really wonderful choice because it allowed us through social media to just go on and be ourselves and be serious when we would naturally be serious and be playful and goofy, uh, when we're feeling playful and goofy and, and it makes people see people behind the company instead of just seeing a nameless, faceless, gray, you know, corporation floating off somewhere collecting money. It's, you know, it's, it's a very new time that we live in and, and we're fortunate that that happened because it really meshed with our personalities. So it sounds like transparency and authenticity is part of your core values then if that's being expressed through how you approach social media and how you talk to your customers. What are some of your other core values? So we have a belief system that we wrote out. It's 25 bullet points long and it was my attempt to teach everyone here what Mike and Ron had taught me when they brought me in as a copywriter and you know the when they brought me in as a copywriter it ended up being truly a life-changing event for me because over those years 
I started to realize all the ways that my old thinking was holding me back and that I really had to embrace an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, which we call the Quest belief system. And in that belief system are simple things like failure is temporary, move quickly past it, you know, because people get really trapped in that stuff where they build their self-esteem around being right or being intelligent um, rather than building their self-esteem around identifying the right answer and being the energy behind it so that they don't fight for a dumb idea just because it was theirs. They truly are open to learning and growing at all times. So we've tried to create... Um, these 25 bullet points to put people in a mental situation where they can be positively rewarded by themselves and by others for actions and behaviors that not only move themselves forward in their own life to something that's way more fulfilling and you know truly capable of joy and it also moves the company forward because we're so hungry for answers we're so hungry to deliver real value and we don't put limitations on ourselves so one of the bullet points is human potential is nearly limitless and you can achieve anything you set your mind to so you know, those positively reinforcing the person for chasing things that are intimate and true for them that are helping them live a more fulfilled life and also allowing them a safe space to make mistakes, to learn and grow, to share those mistakes and the uh, things that they've learned so everyone can grow. Um, it's, it's really, really been neat to watch how this – it's like uh, there's a great book called The Brain That Changes Itself. You know, we're the company that changes itself. The more people you bring on that are growing and learning and getting better, as that happens on the individual level, it's actually changing the entire dynamic of the company because at the end of the day, the company is just a collective of those individual people who are growing and, and getting better. Sure. So how do you identify the right, the right talent and the right team fit for the company? We've got a pretty exhaustive interview process and – one of the things that I tried to do, and, and I kept up with it for, for a lot longer than you might imagine, um, was if you came on board here, you got interviewed by me, and I saw everybody from the janitor to the EVP of sales, it didn't matter, um, you were all going to interview with me now. We've grown so much now at this point. Unfortunately, there's no way to keep up with that, but you're working with your executives, you're working with that core inner team who are all focused on the 25 bullet points, so they're all also trying to get better and learn from if they hire somebody that ended up not fitting, what can we learn from that? And they don't take it as like shame on you for hiring that person, so they'll go, hey, here's what I noticed over time with this person why I don't think they're a fit any longer so that we can look for that in the interview process. And honestly, like here's how my interview process goes. It's really simple. I don't look at resumes. Other people do. Don't get me wrong. Um, but for me, I don't look at resumes. If you make it to me, we'll just pretend for a minute that you can do the job. What I want to know is can you thrive here? Because when people are excited, when they're passionate, when they feel that they have autonomy and they have significance and purpose, those are the things that really drive them. Those are the things that get them really excited. Man, when somebody really feels a sense of purpose and significance, they're unstoppable. They're just more resourceful. They can really tap into their passion. Um, and so finding out if they're going to be able to do that here, it's like that's one of the best gifts that I can give them. So when they come to see me, I say, look – Right now, your goal is to win the job, but don't try to win the job. Try to assess the opportunity, and you should be kicking our tires as hard as we're kicking yours. You need to really look like, can this be the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me? And if it can, awesome, because we're going to work really hard to end metabolic disease. And if you're excited by that, if you're on board, if you believe that we can help you become a better version of yourself, if you think you're going to love the people around you and that energy and enthusiasm, um, then you know it'll be great. But if you don't, if you're, you know, Tony has that great analogy that he uses. You know, people can be passionate, they can be excited, but if they're running east to try and find the sunset, um, you know, it's it's never going to happen. So or a sunrise. I think I just got that backwards, <laughs> but uh, that's why Tony's Tony's the man here. But um, you know, that sense of running in the opposite direction to find the thing that you're that you're looking for that is by definition the other way no matter how optimistic and passionate you are you're never going to get to it so that um, you know we we look for people that would want the correction of course we look for people that can handle that emotionally and can see when we have to make a change and get excited by recognizing when we're moving in the wrong direction get excited to learn something new that we can then apply and move towards yeah so you mentioned as the company has grown, you've no longer been able to to have those those one on one interviews. Um, but I'm sure you have people in place who who use the same the same approach as you did. 
as your company has, how, how big are you guys right now, by the way? Um, well, our valuation's over a billion dollars and we have um, about 1,400 employees. Wow. And that is some seriously fast growth, too. It's ridiculous. Even I'm a little like, wow, I can't believe this is all real. <laughs> That's like the, the classic, uh, what is it, the hockey stick, right, that everybody strives yeah. for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the irony, we kept saying there's no way this growth can keep up, but it has. Yeah. So uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced as, as you've scaled so quickly? Scale. Scale itself is a problem. We are in manufacturing. So you have eight month lead times on equipment. So you can imagine how often we're having to guess and get really good at forecasting and knowing, you know, hey, this thing is coming online or we're expecting the growth to be this, which means we have to get more equipment, which means we have to buy a new facility. I mean, it's just the, the knock on effect. And at our growth rate, you don't have the kind of eight to 12 months that it would normally take to bring on an entire new line to commission it. Um, so we've, we've had to get very clever and all of our vendors refer to us as existing in quest time, uh, because we, we like to move fast. So that, yeah, that's no other way to be. big, but yeah, exactly. So the thing that I think most about is scaling the culture and how you manage to keep that going. You know, even though we've broken the company into three parts and that helps a lot because each one of us, you know, we came up together, we really formulated the mindset together. So this is, you know, something that if you're in any one of those three um, spheres, you're going to see it in action from its roots. But as you go out farther, um, even though we've broken the company up into three bits, it still gets difficult for people on, on the outer edges um, to get that from us. But we've worked really hard to make sure that we've got other leaders in the organization that don't just understand the 25 bullet points, they actually embody the 25 bullet points. And it's actually part of the core curriculum that we teach. We have a training and knowledge department, and they actually teach the 25 bullet points. Um, and that's that's been really cool because honestly, like I believe in those 25 bullet points more than I can tell you. They are exactly what changed my life. And it was one of those things that in we were trying to write our core values and it just it didn't seem real. It didn't seem real. It didn't seem real. So finally, I said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write what I had to learn in order to get myself out of the matrix, which is how I think of it. And so I sat down and literally almost without stopping typing. I wrote down the 25 bullet points, which we, we later brought a group together and we all tried to like be, beef them up and make them more, more robust. But it really was just sort of um, uh, a roadmap, a treasure map, if you will, that, that leads to somewhere. And, and I think if people really embody those 25 bullet points, uh, that it, it really will be life changing. And, and so much of what Tony and I connected over is that he obviously has uh, such a great understanding of that. Me being uh, involved with his teachings from so long ago and my partners and I bonding over him so long ago, I mean, you, you can feel his influence in the 25 bullet points. You know, so much of it is there about how, how to control your mindset and frame things in a way that moves you forward and um, all that good stuff. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's really powerful. And when I see employees using it in their own life, even outside of here, it's, it's really neat. Wow. So... I know you're much more into the people and uh, marketing. I wanted to ask a little bit about some of your processes and your approach to optimizing the business because one of the things that Tony likes to teach in Business Mastery is that you can make very, very small changes to your business, but then over time, the effect that that has on your growth is exponential. So do you have any examples of small changes that you've made or areas of improvement that you've seen a very large return from um, because it just multiplied the, the, the effect? Absolutely. There's really a few. So as you're growing, your company is going to move through multiple phases from a, a purely business system standpoint. So in the beginning, you're in the hustler phase. And we started as a bootstrap startup. We didn't take any outside investment or anything. So we were doing everything. We wore all the hats and we were fulfilling um, off of our living room floor at one point and then my partner's garage. And, you know, so you're really starting small and everybody has to play multiple roles. 
then you start bringing on professional managers and you have to start cleaning up the departments and putting in um, all the systems and processes that you know people sort of collectively call bureaucracy and that's normally uh, said with derision but the reality is you get to a point where the dragon's eating its own tail you can't get any bigger because you, you know with every step you take forward something breaks and so you just start treading water and so as you morph into that professional manager stage you're you know looking at things like Six Sigma and all that stuff and you're bringing in uh, professional tools uh, you're using Salesforce instead of just you know cold calling relationships that the sales guy had from his previous companies you're really having to put all the systems in place that you need uh, to, to continue to grow so no one enjoys that process of maturing all of your systems and becoming very formal and having official um, you know, or formal request procedures and uh, formal documentation procedures. But if you don't do that, you really do hit a point at which you can't continue to scale. And then the other is in manufacturing, you have just a, a, a whole ecosystem of improvements that have to be made to process. So not only do you have to get more efficient, in our case, with the number of bars that you're able to produce on the same piece of equipment, which may come with slight modifications to the equipment itself. It may come modifications to your cleaning procedures, which is an interesting one, right? If you're cleaning the equipment improperly, the motor life may uh, be less, or if your uh, preventative maintenance isn't adequate, then the motor life may be less. And so now you find that your downtimes are increasing because you're not paying attention to that. Another area would be waste. If you're not training your employees well enough and you're either generating in total batch losses, so you have uh, a missed batch where they don't put an ingredient in or they put too much of an ingredient or you know whatever the case may be, but they've been improperly trained or they're not paying attention or whatever the case may be. Um, so all of those systems have such a tremendous impact on your profitability and then your profitability obviously not only dictates the sort of financial security of the company, but it can also dictate things that are uh, percentages of profitability, um, things like your marketing spend or your R&D spend, things that are conditional on the amount that you're making. So really having to be just very, very careful, keeping things very, very, um, you're using a, a constant never improvement. Um, scenario and we actually refer to ourselves as a tech startup and that's how we want our employees to think you know we iterate we improve everything from the way that the line is built to the way that the line is run to the way that people are trained uh, to the products themselves and what they're made of and all of that so um, actually hiring people within the company to be improvement officers uh, is you know is, is pretty critical and and you can by doing things like um, marrying the the typical bureaucracies with the belief system and our um, desire for speed and efficiency, you can actually combat some of the, the lethargy that normally those maturings bring to the organization. So that, that's something that we put a lot of focus on. That's an interesting parallel between manufacturing and more sort of, uh, you know, software or, or startup tech because in both cases, those are highly measurable, right? So those are cold, hard numbers staring at you in the face that you can leverage that data and use it to improve. Um, I think there's a lot of areas where you don't necessarily have those. Um, that actually brings me to, you know, another question sort of around systems and around around cold, hard numbers. Um, how, what has your approach been to sales? Because sales, I imagine, is a huge, huge part of the business. So what's what's been your general approach? And is there anything that you feel that you did differently than your competitors that gave you an edge? Definitely. So we decided uh, and it was a, a big discussion, you know, do we go online first or do we go into stores? And ultimately we decided that we we're going to go online first and the reason being that part of our our reason for existing was to have this relationship with the customer and really, really be a special force in their lives and do something great that they would feel good about and they would feel that, wow, this is a different kind of company. They actually care about me. They're tracking my progress. They're encouraging me along the way. And we had that, you know, the awesome opportunity to actually do that with social media. You know, and in, in the beginning, we really got to know these customers. We knew what they were going after. We knew what their goals were. I mean, it was really, really incredible. 
Um, so doing that and building a direct relationship with our, with our consumer, um, we were doing originally just for, for that reason. But then the other reason that presented itself was as we started to approach retailers, they were making unreasonable demands and they were making it so that they were entirely profitable and we would always be on a razor's edge to where, man, if anything went wrong, we wouldn't be able to absorb that loss because we just weren't profitable enough. So for over a year, we were telling all of the people in our core market, no, you know, we're going to stay um, online only, but we were getting so much traction going back to that notion of being a zero to one event. There was nothing else like our bars on the market. So people were just going in in droves into the health and fitness channel saying, hey, you guys have to carry Quest, you have to carry Quest. So we were getting, you know, at one point after we'd said no, you know, probably four or five times, we were starting to get slightly annoyed phone calls from the guys who are now, you know, our biggest customers because we kept saying no. Um, but it finally got to the point where they had to come to the negotiating table not thinking of us as the, you know, the little guy who they were going to be doing a favor by letting them into the store, but realizing that we were a movement within the industry. And so we were able to negotiate terms that were what, what we would consider very, very fair. Um, so, you know, we're not, we don't want to be parasitic and, and our whole thing is, and I talk to my sales team about this all the time, if our goal is really to end metabolic disease, that's going to take like 25 years. If we're going to be viable in 25 years, we cannot be leaving a wake of people who feel disrespected or taken advantage of, can't be consumers or business partners. You know, we really have to be honorable as we do this. We have to ask ourselves, how can we be good for our partner's business as much as they're going to be good for ours? And so by, by waiting and by having the strength that having such a, an active consumer base that was direct to us online gave us was we could go and present ourselves that way right from the beginning, you know, and, and let people know. And obviously in the beginning, I think as I was saying things like, hey, we want to be a good partner. We're not going to be like other people. Um, they thought, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. But now five years in, we've continued to act with that same um, posture because that's really what we believe. Like to me, that's just, that's a good way to live, let alone a good way to do business. And I've done business the other way where you're just chasing money and you're just trying to grind out every, you know, tenth of a percentage point of profitability that you could. And it's A, it's not fun. There's no sense of connection with your customer or your business partners. And we just thought, you know what, I, I want to like the people I do business with and, and we're just going to act fundamentally differently. It sounds like you've done a great job in the past five years um, communicating with your customers, retaining them, keeping them excited, celebrating them. What is in the pipeline for you guys? What's, what's coming in the next year or even longer, next three to five years that you're pretty excited about that you can share? <laughs> Yeah, so I'll share at a high level. So the thing that we're most excited about is going back to our belief system, right? So you can do anything you set your mind to without limitation. If you're really going to believe that, right, then you'd have to believe, oh, you can build a rocket ship and go to Mars. You'd have to believe that you can end metabolic disease. And we actually do believe that. So we know it's going to be a Herculean task, but we believe in it so much that we're mapping it out and we're making it real and we're making it concrete. And we're saying, okay, what is that actually going to take? Um, what are the metabolic diseases, even just defining that, right? So people for a long time, I think, would have told you that Alzheimer's disease was not a metabolic disease. It was genetic. Uh, when in reality, people are now beginning to call it diabetes type 3, and it does seem to be a blood sugar disorder of the brain. So recognizing that things like that that are sort of longstanding as not being viewed as being metabolically related really are and we're getting same or excuse me similar cues from uh, cancer which also is presenting uh, a very compelling tale of being a metabolic disease and so we're we have funded millions of dollars of research um, into that area looking at what's going on trying to figure out if there's a role for food uh, in helping with that, and, and if so, what that role would be. So, you know, really getting uh, specific about the the metabolic pathways that we're going to have to understand in order to create food to address, and then accepting that humans eat for pleasure, they don't eat for sustenance anymore, uh, because food is so abundant and so readily available, at least here in the West um, and in developed nations. So finding ways to go in and identify the categories that are getting people in trouble and do the hard work of making things 
that you know look and taste like a cookie still look and taste like a cookie but be made with protein and fat and fiber you know and if we can do that then we we should really be able to make a dent as we get into more and more of these product categories so i know a lot of people think of us as either a protein company or a protein bar company but we don't look at ourselves that way we very much look at ourselves as a food company and we're trying to solve a specific problem okay so it sounds like the company and you yourself are so mission driven i I want to sort of wrap this up by uh, asking you if you were going to give some guidance to a young entrepreneur or somebody just entering the workforce about their mission, how, how can somebody identify what they're passionate about and, and really focus their, their career on, on uh, moving that forward? There's a really great book out there called um, Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. And the concept of the book is, look, the passion hypothesis is a little misleading. Uh, and really, there's a step before passion. And that step before passion is interest. And it's really gaining mastery that helps you turn an interest into a passion. And it's very rare that someone has a true passion for something that they either know nothing about or aren't any good at. Uh, and there are, you know, there are exceptions to that, especially in the arts. But for the most part, people really develop an early interest into a true full-blown passion through gaining mastery. So I would encourage people to find something that they're interested in. Don't put the weight of the world on it, right? Like don't, if you're seeking out a relationship, don't approach every person asking yourself like, is this the person I'm going to marry and have kids with? You know, it's like, just ask one question. Do I want to spend the next five minutes with them? And if you do, awesome. And then see where it goes after that. You know, it's very similar when somebody's trying to pursue a passion. Just what are you really interested in? You know, and, and then once you know what you're interested in, start learning more about it. Start going down that path. And if you start gaining some mastery and start, whoa, like now that I really understand this, I'm really falling in love with this. And it's, I really feel it getting inside of me great and if you don't and if you realize okay this isn't the thing that I'm passionate about just uh, you know like Tony says have intention make a decision go somewhere else look at something different get introduced to something you know that isn't in your just everyday environment and then see is there an interest there that could ultimately turn into a passion and and you know ultimately like everything finding that passion can be broken down into smaller steps and you know have fun the whole way and when you find that thing, don't let go. Don't be a servant to money. You know, make money be a servant to you. And, and um, all of a sudden, you will find yourself at least positioned well for both making money and generating real wealth, but doing it in a way where you're serving other people. And there's an amazing quote by Viktor Frankl. And I know that Tony recommends the book, Man's Search for Meaning a lot. And I think that's so wise because it's such an amazing book. And one of the things he says in that book is that happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. Um, and I think the, true, the same is true of wealth. Wealth can't be pursued. It has to ensue. So when you start thinking about how can I serve a community, what big problem out there can I solve? If you focus on that and you stay just hell bent on that as a mission to make that happen, you'll make the right choices, you'll deliver value to people and people will pay for value. And because of that, you'll end up creating something that's really special, that can stand the test of time, that can generate true wealth. And by then you'll have cultivated a sense of fulfillment because you're really doing something beautiful for other people. And then the money just becomes an accelerator for other big problems that you wanna chase and solve. And it's no longer about garnering the money so you can buy stuff. It's about garnering the money so that you can do stuff. And it's the things that you become passionate about doing that you want to execute on, that you want to help other people with, that you feel this just like freakish sense of fulfillment. And then that gives you the drive to keep going. And you just get into this cool, self-reinforcing positive cycle. That's great. That's a great message. I think you'd probably just inspired a ton of people. I hope so. <laughs> well, thanks, Tom, so much for your time. Absolutely. What a pleasure, guys. I'm really honored that you reached out to me. I really believe in what you guys are doing. Um, Tony, in no uncertain terms, has helped me develop the mindset that we have here. And as I told him, look, you didn't know when we started the company that we even existed, but you had a founding hand in this by helping us with our ideology. So I will be eternally grateful to him. Uh, he is just an incredible, incredible human being. Agreed. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much. you have the right mindset and skills to take your business to the next level? Business Mastery is the only event in the world created by Tony Robbins 
to prepare you to master the mindset and skills you need in business to elevate your game. A one-of-a-kind, immersive program, Business Mastery will allow you to understand the critical factors impacting your business, then refocus and realign with the strategy and psychology you need to compete and innovate in any economy. Remember, business success is 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. If you're ready to learn and master the strategies to help you grow your business and stay competitive, then don't hesitate. Apply for the next Business Mastery program now. Learn more about the Business Mastery event at www.tonyrobbins.com. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed by Tony Robbins, hosted by Anna Yorg, and produced by Carrie Song. Brooks Loro is our digital editor. Tyler Culbertson is our media coordinator. Special thanks to Diane Adcock for her creative review. Our website is tonyrobbins.com forward slash podcast, where you can listen to all of our episodes, read articles, and learn more about upcoming events. Copyright Robbins Research International.